This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. To the highway, in a brand new day, gotta let it go. Fast to freedom, stop to Welcome back to Open the Voice Gate for September 15th, 2020. We are members of the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. You can find us on the Voices of Wrestling feed, or you can find us on our own dedicated podcast feed on all podcast platforms and applications. You can find us on Twitter at Open Voice Gate. If you'd like to donate to the show, just click the link in the show notes. It will take you to the red circle, and you click the red button. You can do a single donation or a reoccurring one, and no obligation, but there's certainly... Are appreciated and thank you to our previous donors. I'm one of your hosts. It's your old pal Iron Mike Spears. I'm joined as always by K Slow. In case after nine months, we finally are here doing a big five show preview. Nine months later, God, what a nine months it's been. Uh, but it's it's exciting. I'm sitting here with my my microphone and my Sprite and my Skype call with Mike Spears, and I'm pumped to break down uh, the two Osaka shows that happened over the weekend at the Dangerous Gate card. Like Mike said, like we talked about last week, the first big five of the year with No Dead or Alive, with Kobe World, which is typically in July, being pushed to November. We are at a big show. Uh, a big show, really, other than Cork and Halls and Osaka number twos. You know, we had a full capacity champion gate at the end of February, early March, but it's just, it's weird to think... That this is it. That that we're finally gonna get some sort of of uh, payoff. Builds are going places. We're seeing angles conclude. New angles begin. It's really exciting. I'm really looking forward to this show. Yeah, and it's something that really with like everything. This will be Dragon Gates at least for what I stand understand that Oda City General Gymnasium is going to be at. This will be Dragon Gates biggest crowd of the year, even with restrictions. Maybe maybe a, the Torimon a reunion show might have been a little bit bigger, but that's the world we live in now. But this is like a big crowd. It's the big Tokyo show each year with how everything is kind of moved around. We have a lot of stuff coming to head on the 21st. And, you know, there was a lot of stuff really over Osaka kind of as like we were talking about this last week of Cork and how Cork and kind of felt like a go home, but still had to put some like some some other things in the oven to get ready for uh, uh, dangerous gate but really like these two Osaka shows and and then we have one more televised show coming up beforehand it's it's a busy time for Dragon Gate I do feel like that the last eight that the eight show August kind of prepared us for like how busy things are going to be but like whenever I look at the schedule I'm like all right oh so they've already have tickets on sale for Kobe World they already have tickets on sale for Gate of Origin we're in the thick of it and it really it truly really starts on on Sunday it's awesome I the Ever since crowds returned, and and I like the direction of the company at the start of the year. You mentioned the Torimon reunion show, which that just hit me like a ton of bricks that that happened this calendar year. But I, I like the start of the year. I think I was probably a little bit higher than most on the empty arena shows. I thought what needed to deliver, delivered, even if nothing was really great with the exception of the Ishida Okuda Bravegate match on those shows, I, I thought it was a time well spent. And then ever since July, when crowds returned, I I have really liked seemingly every show they've put on, minus maybe the Fukuoka shows, just because that building has its own issues. And these Osaka shows continue that trend. And given just what we've seen from the roster this year and the card that is going to happen in, in Oda War City Gymnasium, I have no doubt that Dangerous Gate is going to deliver. And then it is, you know, another October Cork, and then, you know, two giant shows 
in November plus Gate of Origin, and then we're at December in Corkin and Final Gate. So the the end of end of the year is here, but the end of the year is not going to slow down. It is going to go by very quickly because there are tons and tons of big and important shows happening for the rest of 2020. Yeah, yeah, and it all starts on the 21st. On this week's update, we're going to run down what happened in Osaka. We'll touch on the one last show that there actually is. Like we, We've been talking about Go Homes, but if there's truly a Go Home, there's no better way to go home than Masato Yoshino's homecoming show coming up on the 19th, and then we will give our deep preview into Dangerous Gate. So first off, we have the uh, Osaka doubleheader, which is something that they don't usually have a fall doubleheader and I wonder if a lot of this is now knowing that, all right, with restrictions and with, like, people aren't, yeah, I'm, I mean, crowds are down, and that's understandable, but it's also something where it's, like, with Dragon Gate, they depend on ticket sales, so running a doubleheader for two days makes more sense than running a half, a half arena that might have two-thirds of the capacity in, and that's kind of what we got with these two Osaka shows on the 12th and the 13th case. Just overall, what were your thoughts of this weekend in Osaka? Well, on both shows, matches four, five, and six either were really good to great, or they were important in the in the grand sense of, of the storyline. Matches one through three, I think we'll, we'll quickly brush by them on both shows, didn't do a ton for me, but I came out of this weekend with uh, one, I'm going to do some on-air math here, one, two, and then I believe there's a, a third four-star match. Uh, did I go spreadsheet on I went spreadsheet on three matches this weekend so it is a a rousing success in my opinion yeah I was surprised when I was updating like my recommendation list like how much stuff that I had as a must watch for me which for me that means that it's above three and three quarters just was a very solid show it did have pretty slow goings early on but coming out of it it seemed like that everything's hanging the stride and nothing seems to be like a feud where I'm like, all right, let's wrap it up here. Let's wrap it up. I'm 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 not necessarily looking towards uh, Dangerous Gate coming out of these shows as tired of any of the feuds, which is something that has been a problem with the promotion in the time in the past. We're like, okay, we know this is going to probably go past this show, but we have to go through this here. Like everything here, it seems like they're it's hitting its stride at the right time. No, there's no Shingo versus Saito or Ata versus Dragon Kid. Really, most of the roster. Of, of guys that are in some sort of pushed capacity, I think you can make an argument, and Mike and I would certainly hear you out, that Takashi Yoshida is probably overused. There is a lot of punch Tamanaga on these shows, but he's not really <laughs> he's not really in a role of importance, so I don't mind. He's typically on the on the undercard and is just doing his thing. No one feels over pushed right now, with again the exception of Yoshida. I like the direction of the Brave Gate belts. The twin gate match for Dangerous Gate has me really excited. Uh, the Dreamgate situation, I mean, we haven't really seen anyone step up to Ata for the title because he's been building to this cage match, but other than the sort of weak main event of the September Cork, and I've enjoyed the build of the cage match. So everything is working right now. I think they are far and away not only the best book company in Japan, I do think they have been the best book company in the world this year. I like a lot of what All Elite Wrestling does, but I do... There are just, there's typically on on a dynamite, there's one or two segments that I just don't know about. And maybe I wouldn't have done this with the booking and this and that and this and that, which maybe some of it is personal preference. But with Dragon Gate, it's just really good right now. And we're coming on this podcast every week. And I know we're saying the same thing of it's really good right now, but it is. It's, It's quality storytelling up and down the card. It's really exciting. I like what they're building to. And let's quickly get into these Osaka shows so we can talk about Dangerous Gate coming up on Monday. Yeah, let's do that. The first show was on the 12th. Attendance was 207, down from 309, but this was a double header, so it kind of worked out in the end. Opening match was a six-man tag team match. Punch Tomonaga, UT, Hoho Loon versus the RED team of Kaido Ishida, Diamante, and Kazuma Sakamoto. Ishida got the submission on Tomonaga in 12 minutes and 32 seconds with the ankle hold. Uh, I thought this was a f- decent and fine opener we got to see some UT and Ishida which is what I was really hoping from from this match and you know I mean if Punch Monaga is going to be on undercards like this I'm okay with it you know actually for as good as chemistry as Ishida and UT have the spot of this match for me involved Ishida and Punch where they were they built to a punch hot tag 
and he and Ashita come at each other, and Ashita goes to throw a roundhouse kick, and Punch does his back bend out of the way of it, and it was just a good looking spot. And then Sakamoto came in, and they and they ran some spots from there. Look, it's a bold move to give Ho Ho Loon and Punch Tamanaga 13 minutes in the opener, but all things considered, a relatively inoffensive match. Yeah, everyone pulled their weight. When you like look at this show, if you're not keeping up with it, you'd be like, oh. UT, man, you're going to have to be putting some work in here, but everyone acquitted themselves well. I went three stars on this match. This was a perfectly competent and a good time opener. Yeah, I completely agree. All right, match two was Dragon Gate versus RED singles match. It was Hio versus Yosuke San Maria. Hio got the surprise win, but it builds into the storyline. With he, he got a pin after outside interference when basically there was a weapon finish. And like my big takeaway from this is it's, they keep on putting Hyo in like these matches where I get why they put Hyo in these matches, but you put them in, in these matches and you're not going to get like the big crowd reaction you win. And I felt like that this might have been the weakest match on the weekend just because of it. Just the crowd was absolutely dead, even though Maria is someone who is kicking on all gears right now. Hyo is an, just an interesting wrestler in the sense that I think he works better as a heel, but also works better from underneath. So. Like, the condo match, even though they did nothing for 120 seconds of that match, the condo match ended up being pretty enjoyable. Here, I just thought the dynamics were a little bit off, and although I just spent the first five minutes of the show praising the booking and how much I'm enjoying it, I understand that Maria lost this match due to a Sheeta interference and weapon spots, and I get that. I... I thought this cooled the Brave Gate match at Dangerous Gate just a little bit. Now, I think they made up for it in night two, which is why I didn't lead off with, with having an issue about this. But because Maria is always on the cusp of losing and, and can really bend back and forth between comedy fodder and legitimate champion challenger, I just would have had her overcome the odds a little bit here. I would have liked to have seen her you know, maybe take that weapon spot and then kick out of Hyo move and then hit her finish and get a definitive win over someone that she is, you know, given the history, just definitively better than and higher up on the roster than a guy like Hyo. I think her losing was a little bit of a mistake, but seeing what they did in the second night, I can forgive it slightly, but I, I was not into this match. Yeah, this is probably the one match I'd say outright skit on the weekend. Then we got into a tag team match. This was Ultimo Dragon Ryo Saito versus the unaffiliated team of Masaki Mochizuki and Gamma. Ultimo got the uh, pin on Mochizuki with the Law of Magistral Cradle in 11 minutes and 35 seconds. You know, this was a, a bit more feisty in this. And then we have like this dynamic with Ultimo and Sairio where it's just like Ultimo has to put up with all of his students' bullshit a lot. And this was a match where he's just like, wow, I have to deal with Sairio because I'm dealing with Sairio. And going up against a team like Mochizuki and Gamma who are willing to just kind of get goofy with it. And that, that kind of is what their role is right now and ended up being just like a decent little like tag match. I went three and a quarter on it. The, the, it, the Ultimo sort of exhibition style matches are really interesting because I like his chemistry with Saito a lot. I think they actually do very funny comedy, which I've never really seen Ultimo in that role before. And Mochizuki and Gamma, you know, have played their part the entire year well. We talked about it. I don't know if it was last week or a few weeks ago, but Mochizuki's focus has been on pro wrestling Noah this year, which sucks because as we've established on this show, current day Noah is so ungodly bad and I hate the booking so much, but that is where Mochizuki has, has tended to put his focus. I am slightly worried and I have no evidence to base this off of, no proof. It's just an inkling. I'm afraid that Mochizuki has been cycled down the card so much this year that maybe this is his future and maybe we don't see him in a unit again. And maybe he sort of does not to say that he would go freelance, but he just works different promotions around Japan on a more frequent basis. I would love once this generational warfare story is over, which who knows when that will be. I'm thinking at some point early next year, just given the history of blood warriors versus junction three, but I can't say for sure. I would love as soon as this current big storyline is over for Mochizuki to immediately find a unit and to immediately, you know, form a tag team, form a trios team, go for another singles run. I hope that happens at some point because I would hate for this to be the future of Mochizuki in Dragon Gate when we know that he can still go. That being said, it's a fine little match. I mean, if this is what Mochizuki's future is, that's what it is. I hope it's not. 
but he seems to get a kick out of wrestling Ultimo and teaming with Ultimo, and I think that's nice. It was it was for me a nice little three star match. Yeah, and I think that with Mochizuki being the best active wrestler above the age of fifty, and seeing that he's still, I I I get the sense that him working Noah is a lot like when they had other feuds that he sat out of and he just went and go did more touring stuff. So I don't have any belief to think that this is like a winding down of Misaki Mochizuki. He's still going to have like an insane amount of matches this year. It just doesn't seem like that. It's something where like he, he took himself out of this uh, feud and it makes sense. And when this, when he takes himself out of feuds like this, he kind of ends up doing this in the past. He's done this before. So it is what it is. And I think that whenever the generation war is over, I fully expect him to find a place. I mean, there's always the Mochi Fuchi tag team that is a good use for those two guys if they're not doing huge singles things. So I, I, I'm not like too worried about it, but I'm fine with him just kind of just fooling around with Ultimo Dragon and Sairio if that's kind of where he's at right now or in the current position. So I was okay with that. You, but then the card goes. Well, I was going to oh, say, go you know, you, you talk about, well, there's always room for Mochi Fuji. Well, given what we've seen, uh, maybe there's not. Maybe Fuji Kondo is the future that that not only do we, do we want, but quite honestly, Mike, it's the future we deserve. Oh yeah, oh yeah, no, and that is something we can get into with this next match. It was a trios match, unaffiliated teams again, because we had Jimmy in here. Jimmy making, I think it was like his first televised appearance, really. I think maybe since. Uh, early August, I want to say, just off the top of my head. Like, we've, we've not been getting a lot of Jimmy on these shows, but it was a trios match. Masato Yoshino, Don Fuji, Suji Kondo versus Benke, Keske Akuda, and Jimmy. Yoshino got the win on Jimmy with the Torbellino Crucifix in 17 minutes and 23 seconds. And, Case, I want you to give your thoughts first because I love this match. Yeah, Jimmy has not worked – well, he worked dark matches on two different KBS Hall shows – but he has not been in front of crowds on the main card since before the shutdown. Uh, just just the Lapis Hall shows and the Empty Green Osambo Hall shows uh, this year. And then, you know, obviously stuff pre-COVID. I, look, I love this match. It, I mean, the Kondo Fuji team is so entertaining because it's not, it's not just the simplicity of of big guys throwing around small guys or big guys clashing into, you know, a Ben K or another bigger guy on the roster. Fuji and Kondo excel in that role. Shuji Kondo, if there was if there was a comeback wrestler of the year award and the observers or any, you know, whatever new sheet site that does their year under the awards, Shuji Kondo's the answer. Because Kondo went from being a complete non entity Really, I mean, what, since 2014, maybe? I mean, when was the last time he teamed with Kaz Hayashi on a regular basis? To, he's been legitimately great since July, since I have had five, this match included, five spreadsheet four stars or higher Shuji Kondo matches since July 4th when he returned to the promotion full-time. It's been an incredible story to watch. He and Fuji going at it with Ben K and Akuda in particular was a delight. But Mike, my question for you is Jimmy. I know we, we disagreed a little bit on the Lapis Hall shows because Jimmy put on so much body weight and he was kind of having a hard time controlling his flips and he just looked a little bit more awkward. You were more down on him than I was. What did you think of Jimmy in this match? I thought he looked great. Oh my God, he looks so good. I, I thought that, I mean, it's clear that everyone bulked up to then get more cut. Like now, <laughs> now I think we could say that well, when Ben K decided to add 50 pounds and lose 30 of it immediately, you know, that made sense. They were, they were bulking up for a cut and he looked great. His body control is back to what we expected. This is the Jimmy that I ranked on my prospects list. And I really enjoyed it. I thought he was really good. And of course, you know, you have someone like Kondo who is just such a presence now and Fuji who started screaming out in this match that he is a Rudo. Like he like that's what he was shouting most of the match was I am a Rudo. Did you notice that? I, I did I not, just, but that is very on brand for him. <laughs> it just was like tremendous. Just like how this match went. I was a slightly down, but three and a, three quarters. So I mean, like that's basically we're in the same territory there. But it was just like these six guys are really fun together. This continued the Okuda mental breakdown, I guess, for lack of words, or losing whatever chill he used to have, maybe, is another way to put it. <laughs> and 
where he's like, after the match is over, threw off his gloves, left the ring, and Ben K was like, "What's going on, bro? What are you doing here?" And it just is something that also like having Suji Kondo back and him having like this immediate chemistry with all these young guys, like where thing where like Benke countered the Lanzarose and then Suji Kondo countered the spear and just like all right like and that's like one of the frustrating things about the air win is Suji Kondo was supposed to be in for King of Gate we could have had like a 13 minute big guy slam fest between these two that we didn't have and I'm hoping that sometime in the future we still get to have because I absolutely love this and you know it's one of the things that I I'm glad to see that Jimmy's back on the cards and being put into a tough position and knocked it out of the park i hope that the booking continues to get a little bit weirder on the undercards and maybe we get a condo versus jimmy like match two and fukuoka next time they're there i I do like like jimmy i want to spend just a little bit more time on it because i loved his individual performance in this match because he reminded me of i i just i'm gonna use the real sports comp here of the current Miami Heat team and a guy like Duncan Robinson, where maybe Duncan Robinson's not an elite tier NBA player. You know, he's never going to be an all-star. He's never going to be an all NBA guy, but he's surrounded by a lot of talent by guys like Jimmy Butler and like Bam Adebayo. And I do think Kaisuke Ikuda is the Jimmy Butler of professional wrestling. Let me go on the record and say that now. But what I love about Jimmy was that he was playing above his skill level in this match. Oh yeah. He was desperately trying to hang with Yoshino and Fuji and Kondo and was just going for it. He was just kind of relentless and fearless, and it was great to see that seep into this match. This match went 17 minutes. It got plenty of time. And while a guy like Ben K has established himself on the level of everyone on the opposing team, I mean, Ben K hit a double spear and took down Fuji and Kondo, which is the biggest spear you're going to get on this roster. Okuda is, you know, quite honestly, on a similar plane. I mean, Akuda's a, a, a proven commodity at this point, but Jimmy was, you know, the odd man out. If you know anything about, you know, Japanese booking, it, you look at this match and you go, well, either Jimmy's going to become the next main eventer or he's taking the fall, and it's, you know, a, a 10-90 split with 90 being that he's going to take the fall, and that's exactly what happened, but it, it was worked in a way that I just loved his individual performance. He really gutted it out and went for it, and came up short, and now I want to see him wrestle again. I want to see him follow up. It was great in-ring booking. I just, I love this match. And it's something that this is the big, like, problem of the riches of the roster. I mean, Jimmy basically was sidelined because they're just worse. They had so many matches, almost so many shows. Almost all of them were on TV, so they couldn't just have, like, a house show match with Jimmy on it where he could have made his claim and put him on TV. Like, you have to kind of like portion out to the stuff that was going on here, but he was given an opportunity here. And I hope that it continues more. I know that it's something that when he came over, like it, it's like, we're thinking about like, it was supposed to be like a, I believe a six month stint and that would be coming up soon, but it'd be a real shame if he goes back to Mexico now. Cause I'm like, all right, he's finally getting that opportunity to step up. I want to see more of Jimmy. I want to see what's going to happen with Jimmy throughout the rest of September in 2020. And I hope that that happens. I know I'm saying this right after they just launched an Amazon exclusive show in which Mike and I both trashed last week and said that we were not going to watch, but that's also that's because it's hard to watch given our geographic locations, but I would love- And price. And, and, and price. And, and price. Mind you, I'm a poor college student, okay, Dragon Gate? Uh, the, the network sets me back every month, but I would love, with the surplus of talent that Dragon Gate has right now, for them to launch- a New Japan strong type B show just for the network, run it in an empty arena and have it be, you know, your Jimmy's and your UT's and your, you know, Akuda could be a main eventer on that show. And even your older guys. I mean, we'll talk about Sachi Hoko boy coming up. It's the first time he's made TV since the Toriyaman reunion show this year. There's just so much, there's a surplus of talent on a roster that has always been known for being really small and compact and everybody has their place and you can cycle guys up and down the card. We're now at a point where, I mean, even a guy like Takashi Yoshida, an established former champion, he's not even getting booked on every show. Now, granted, we'll take the wins when we can get them, but he's not even being booked (laughs) on every show because there's so much, there's so many guys on the roster right now. I would love to see them implement, whether it's just, you know, running next again and i don't know filming next and uploading it wouldn't that be great or if it's some sort of smaller inconsequential out of canon second brand 
I they've just they've got you know the four young boys and Jimmy and all these other guys. It would be great to see them get even more attention than they're already getting. Oh no, I'm absolutely with you on this, and I'd argue that if they wanted to have a sh- series of shows where it was even them like running like first ring or shank or, or like just like places like basement monster like small venues that you're just like okay we're just we'll sell like 50s to 150 tickets that's fine but it, it would be a very interesting thing for them to do i don't support i don't support anybody running basement monster during covid but under normal circumstances i actually really like that venue it is like the less shitty version of the ace arena in union city new jersey it is an actual small arena that works (laughs) and is conducive to wrestling again during covid it it's literally if you put two humans in that arena it is impossible for them to social distance it is so small but under normal circumstances i would love for them to have some sort of young dragons cup in that in that building or something it would be really unique but again let's get the vaccine and then we will worry about running the smallest building in japan i mean it's no chofu heartful hall but it's up there or or it's down there i should say <laughs> <laughs> So the semi-main event was a straight tag, Dragon Gate versus R.E.D., Yamato and Kai, the former Tribe Vanguard Twin Gate team, versus Big E, Ada, and Big R. Shimizu. They were united for this night. Yamato got the win on Shimizu with the Galleria in 15 minutes and 6 seconds. Again, this was another pretty much of a cage preview match. Then we had, we'd have a bigger one the next night. Yeah, I, I've talked about it, you know, for a few episodes now. I just, I, I like the Yamato and Kai tag team. I don't like their chemistry with R.E.D., though. I would like to see Yamato and Kai versus, say, Fuji and Kondo. I think that'd be very entertaining. This was a lot of friendly fire between Eita and Shimizu, as I expected. A fine match. Did its job. Uh, not one that I would necessarily recommend, just because I am not keen on their current in-ring chemistry. I'll say this in the defense of this match. I like this match of the idea of Shimizu and Ada have not been on the same page pretty much ever since they dropped the Twin Gate titles. And they were slowly kind of working themselves back onto the same page in this match. And then suddenly, like, and, and then you had the finish, and then immediately uh, Ada just started chewing out <laughs> Shimizu. So I thought it was, like, interesting in that context. But, yeah, no, that the, this uh, former Tribe team does not necessarily mesh that well with the uh, – with the red team so i totally get your argument there i ended up really enjoying this i mean i went three and a half stars on this although this was a decent semi main i went three and a quarter so we're not that far off yeah yeah main event was dragon gate versus tori mon eight man tag team match the dragon gate team was kz kota minora jason lee and dragon daya the tori mon team was dragon kid naruki doi susumi Akosuka, and kakatora kz got a pen for like the first time that i can remember on tv with the kz time on Kakator in 18 minutes of 42 seconds and what I thought was the match of the weekend. Mike, I tweeted it out from the Open the Voice Gate account. KZ wrestled this match not like he was trying to prove that he was one of the best wrestlers in the world. KZ wrestled this match like he was trying to prove that he was the best wrestler in the world. And I, I look, I don't know where he stands with the company. I don't know the political ramifications that could occur from it, but In my fandom mind, I am now at a point where when I refer to KZ and the Open the Dreamgate title, it is not a matter of if, but a matter of when. Because I think he has uh, more than enough talent, more than enough charisma, seems to be uh, uh, more over than he needs to be to justify a role at the top of the company. I, I can't possibly even adjust my expectations uh, to to this Naruki Doi match coming up on Dangerous Gate, because if we've learned anything from the history of KZ and random undercard singles matches on big shows, meaning KZ versus Shun Skywalker last year at World, this could very easily be the match of the night in their chemistry at Cork and Hall, which was uh, this match, but with UT subbed in for Dragon Daya, in their chemistry here, not to mention their match of the year contender that they had in February, I am I am ready to crown that match at four and a half stars before it's even happened. KZ <laughs> is just on another level right now. And, you know, look, we're going to give Ata a chance. We're going to see what happens with the Dreamgate after this cage match. But all I can think right now is, God, 
KZ, that is the guy. For as exciting as Dragon Daya is, there are years before I, I think he's ready for, you know, a sniff at the Dreamgate title. For as good as Kaisuke Akuda is, he's not that guy. It is KZ. He is the guy. I was blown away with this match. Four and a quarter stars on a limited capacity Osaka number two show. That is what I'm talking about. Mike Spears, you have the floor. Yeah, uh, I was four and a quarter as well. You wax po- poetic about KZ. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a guy named Dragon Daya. Because KZ, as you said, you're absolutely right on just on another level right now. The one other thing I'll, I'll add in. He's a guy that you could trust to do mic work as champion. And that's something that, especially in this company, matters a whole lot. So that's some that's another added thing for him as well. But Dragon Daya, a lot of this match was based around Dragon Daya and that he was the person taking most of the heat. And he is one of the he is up there as one of the best babyface cells of this generation. Like he gets it and he's emoting through a mask. But he gets how like to sell things and be able to like get such sympathy for it. That, I mean, the the crowd was going nuts for this match. Like as much as a crowd can without them getting in trouble again, this crowd was hot for this match. And then he does a thing like where like Casey comes with a house of fire, and then Daya comes in and he does a running shooting star press, a pretty normal thing. Case I I would say that Dragon Daya being able to do one of the best running shooting star presses is not a new thing, right? Like he's been doing that now for the last year. No, it's a staple in his arsenal. But he does it in a way that he does not come straight on, which is an issue with a lot of wrestlers that if they have to like change direction of the body, he's not positioned right, it looks like crap. He was this bot. I forgot who he did it to, but it was not exactly perpendicular. So he rotated his body in midair. So he almost gave it like, it was almost like he was doing the black arrow in a way, but not a full rotation. But he was able to, to on the, from the mat onto someone on the mat, from the mat, transition his body. And it was like one of the more like astounding things I've seen. I was like, I believe it when they say that, oh, he could do anything now. So it just was like an astounding thing. It just was amazing stuff. One of the best eight man tags I've seen in a long time. And eight man tags, one of my favorite matches. Cause I feel like that you get a lot of variety there and you can see how things can go and you can go a lot of different ways with this. And this one was truly exceptional. And again, I thought it was the match of the weekend. Yeah. The off axis running shooting star press that Daya busted out here. It's just another one of those things he does where, I mean, if uh, you know, I hope post COVID that the MLD, the MLW deal is realized in some form because, you know, one, they run Chicago and I'd like to be able to go see Dragon Gate guys in person, but just <laughs> the idea of, of Daya showing up to America and even just doing stuff like that, it's just, it's on another level of even guys like the Rascals, who I really like and who are Strong Hearts affiliated and have trained with Shima. Daya just kind of blows them away. And I just, I, I don't think there's anybody really close uh, to the to the level of aerial ability that he has right now, with the exception of Pac and Will Ospreay and maybe Hiromu or Dragon Lee. But honestly, I, I really do think Dragon Daya is on their level in terms of what he can do. And, you know, uh, the weird thing about Dragon Gate this year, this is one of the best multi-man matches there has been. If you look at the top of my match of the year spreadsheet right now, it's Doi versus KZ, Doi versus Ata, and Doi versus Yokosuka. And then the next, you know, two to round out the top five, it's Ben K and Yamato versus Hulk and Sakamoto from the January Korokan. And then uh, from the July Osaka show, Ben K, Kai, Strong Machine J, and Yamato versus Dragon Kid, Yoshino, Kondo, and Yokosuka. That was an eight-man tag as well. That one I went four and a half on. Other than that, this is the next best multi-man match I've seen this year. This is a rare year in Dragon Gate where the singles matches have really stood out. And granted, I've got a, a lengthy list of multi-mans that proceed, or I guess that follow, rather, this match that we're talking about here. But the high-end stuff has been singles matches, but this match needs to be in the conversation for the best stuff that has happened in Dragon Gate this calendar year. Yeah, and it really topped off the strong first night of Osaka. It'll be up on the network right until Dangerous Gate. So if you're staying up and you haven't caught up here, this is this show has some stuff to get back into, as does the next night. It was also an ED on 2 on the 13th. Attendance was up to 289. So came out for this two days of having attendance right under 500. So basically 
you know, half capacity. But, I mean, it's that's why you run a doubleheader in these conditions because, I mean, it went from, like, 300 down to 280, uh, 207 up to 289, so attendance was fine. Uh, the opener was a real shenanigan-heavy trios match with Ultimo, Don Fuji, and Dragon Kid versus Masaki, Mochizuki, Gamma, and Punch Tomonaga. Don Fuji hit a super choke slam on Punch Tomonaga in 13 minutes and 42 seconds. You know, when Ultimo debuted in the company, you and I were rightfully very nervous about what kind of Ultimo we were going to get, and I talked a few weeks ago about how nice it's been to see him settle into these openers, to an extent check his ego at the door, even if he did wear all gold against the Dragon Gate generation, who wears all gold. I did think that was a bold move, but what I loved about Ultimo this match, there's a moment where uh, Punch takes control, or I'm sorry, Ultimo takes control of Punch with a side headlock, and does just the most basic wrestling spot there is, side headlock, punch to the face, and because uh, Punch's gimmick, I guess, is that he has a hard head, Ultimo sold his hand so well. Like, his hand just got blowed off by trying to punch this this Tabanaga kid in the head. And it was just a lovely spot that made me go, oh my god, it's great that Ultimo's home. It's great that he's in the promotion that would not exist without him. But, shenanigans heavy is the right word. I told you the spot that's worth watching. Mike told you the finish. You can save 13 minutes and move on to something else. Yeah, and then we had match two. It was uh, Genki Horikuchi and Suzumi Yokosuka, the Kyushu Pro Tag Team Champions, as they were announced coming down the ring, against Keisuke Okuda and Jason Lee. Okuda got the win over Genki Horikuchi. The lights out in 11 minutes and 36 seconds. That should tell you how Dragon Gate views Kyushu Pro right there. <laughs> and then stormed out of the ring. You know, I mean, this was like, a, the, this also had a, a lot of kind of just comedy things where Cyria was on the outside teaching Jason Lee how to do a hair ringer on Kinky Horiguchi. And, you know, this is low stakes and fun. And then Okuda got the win, didn't stick around, get his hand raised, tossed his gloves up into the air as high as he could and just stormed out afterwards. Yeah, this is four talented guys having a very mediocre match. I was a little let down by this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it just was one of those things that, I mean, this happens on these shows, especially on a back-to-back. Uh, the next match case, this was one of our, this was a condo bet that we had. It was Shuchi Kondo versus Kento Kabune. The finish was the Gorilla Clutch, as we all could have guessed. However, we made a gentleman's wager last show, gentleman's wager, on where I set a time and you guessed if this match would go above it and below it. And the time I set was eight minutes. You took the over. I took the under since I took the t- since I set the time. Eleven minutes and twenty nine seconds. Case is now two and zero in Suchi Kondo bets. And um, was my bookie offering this or not? I, I I went and checked there. You know, I was able to get a bet on Brock Lesnar's next contract. <laughs> I have a high. Sp- I have a Heisman Trophy bet. I don't even know if they're giving out the Heisman this year, but I have that in with that as well. Not a lot of Dragon Gate stuff, to be fair. Look, I... So, no. I, they did not listen to the show and set a bet based off of the condo bet. I know, so. they, I know they didn't listen to the show because we don't have the logo attached to our Open the Voice Gate feed anymore, or a, a, ever. We, do, we don't have the My Bookie money coming in. It is... I, look, I'm anti-gambling uh, for only for the reason that I was raised anti-gambling, and it is by far the one definitive thing that my parents, like at a young age, were like, hey, don't do this. And I was like, okay, good enough for me, and never questioned it and have never gone back on it. If they offered Dragon Gate bets, I would probably sign up for them because I was correct in, in thinking that Kabune would last as long as he did. Mike, I got news for you. This match was built entirely around Kento Kabune selling the leg for Shuji Kondo. What this is to me is open the Dream Gate prep work for Kento Kabune as he will one day be headlining this company. This was, uh, you know, a weird old guy versus young lion dynamic, but worked in a legitimate way that made it seem like, okay, Kabune can do this. He can work a singles match that's 12 minutes long, built around selling, and he can succeed. And while this match started a little bit slow, I really enjoyed it in the end, and I went three and a half. I went three and three quarters, and made my extra quarter was, and the first big opening thing was Kobune immediately attacked him, tossed him to the outside, tried to do a missile drop kick on the floor, and Shuchi Kondo just went, nope, and he just ate it. Yes. And that cracked me up. Like, enough that I actually, for me, I could tell if the match is hitting with me if I ever verbally emote during a match, and I went, oh, fuck, when that happened, because that looked like that sucked. And after that, we had, like, as you said, a great uh, big little vet versus rookie match that the crowd was getting into Kabuna. He is 
a great he's great at selling for this thing like he gets like that kind of thing there and you're absolutely right about how this is like almost a preview match and also kabune did a great job of making kondo look like the guy he is like he sold incredibly well to get over the fact that shuji kondo is the former power fighter of 2e2p like it was like he understood his role in this match and it ended up being a very fun match and probably my favorite match on the show yeah, it's uh, I, I like the match that followed it just a little bit more, but I was really impressed. I mean, I you know I joke about the ceiling that Kabuna has, but I think you know there's legitimacy to it. Again, to to be you know we what debuted in December, we didn't really see him a ton at the start of the year. Obviously, everything was delayed because of COVID. So we're looking at a guy who's realistically six to eight months into his career, just in terms of you know working in front of people or working just on shows that are taped. And he's working a 12-minute match with Shuji Kondo and was legitimately good, not just playing his role of plucky underdog, you know, startup guy. He was legitimately good in this match, and I think it is is worth pointing out and celebrating to an extent. Now, I don't know what is wrong in the head with the class of 2020 that makes them want to jump Kondo and Fuji either during their entrance or as the match starts. <laughs> I'm not a health and safety professional, but I would not recommend that. It does seem to end up poorly for them. But we got 12 minutes of good they're action. Out of yeah, look, they're, they're using their outdoor voices. They're attacking these men twice the size of them. I wouldn't recommend it, but more power to them. Yeah, these two, uh, I mean, these four kids aren't right in the head in the, in the best kind of way. It's like, oh, yeah, you have, like, Shuji Kondo probably has 75 pounds on Kento Kubune, and I think that's me being generous there. I don't think I'm being generous there. I think it's, that's there. He has at least half a foot on him. He decides... Nope, I'm going to go after this big guy. He's old. I hate him. And, you know, it's tremendous. I love this class of 2020, and I was someone who loved the class of 2016, and I like these kids even more. And that's something that I did not necessarily think would happen necessarily so quickly. And it just was like, you know, I will watch a Shuchi Kondo rookie rush series. That is my idea of a good time. Call me a sadist there. But that is what I love in wrestling, and I and this is like the best use of them using like the obligatory singles match in a great fashion versus the previous night. Wouldn't it be great? I'm I'm gonna fantasy book for 15 seconds here. Please indulge me. But wouldn't it be great if on a Sambo Hall show they booked um a a Toriumon versus rookies tr- uh, trial match series, and they just did you know Kondo versus Fujikawa and Fuji versus Kabune, and they just, you know, ran through the four rookies with four vets, and the rookies lost all four matches. I would I would really like that. I think we're at that point now where, again, they're they're being featured so much, and they're getting so much offense in on the Torimon guys. Something is bound to happen, whether it's the unmasking as the new demon, whether it's joining up with the Dragon Gate generation, maybe one of them swerves and joins R.E.D., I do not know. But at some point, we're going to have to start doing something with these guys because they're talented enough to justify their spots on the roster, which means that, you know, a Maria or a UT or whoever else, we're going to have more people lose spots because these four hotshots came in and have taken things over since their debuts. So you want to have Fujikawa versus Kondo. You want to have Kabune versus Don Fuji. I think uh, Madoka Kakuta versus uh, Masaki Mochizuki. That would be incredibly interesting to me. Kamai, kind of want to see Kamai versus, I mean, that's a tough one there. Like, Kamai versus Benkei, well, I feel I, like, would be interesting. But If we're going to go with the Torimon guys, I think you got to look at Kamai as, it would be fun to see Doi slap around a rookie, just because Doi rarely works just with those guys. Yokosuka, obviously an answer there. Obviously, if Mike Spears and I have the pencil, we are booking uh, Taketo Kamai versus Super, Super Shisa. That is headlining the show. That is getting 15 minutes, and fun will be had uh, by at least Mike and I. I don't know about all, but Mike and I would enjoy that very much. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I feel like that the true heads out there would really enjoy to see the inventive ways that Shisa can make Kamai scream. That would be really you know, nice. The, the true ones. The true ones would get that. And then the true ones will also have a good time with this tag match, which is something that I did not think it would necessarily happen given one person in there. It is another eight man tag, Dragon Gate versus RED, Maria, Minora, UT, and Daya versus Ishida, Yoshida, Diamante, and Sakamoto. Uh, Maria got the pen in the preview on Ishida with a leg roll clutch in 14 minutes and 10 seconds. And this was really the peak of Ishida and his goons going at the Dragon Gate 
folks. And I thought like that this was a really fun preview match because you had a preview of this and you also had a preview of the Triangle Gate match in this. You know, it's funny. It sounds like the RED side maybe stood out to you a little bit more in this just because, I mean, Ishida is so, is so good. And again, he's leading, you call them the goons. They're, uh, they're a whack pack with Yoshida, Diamante, and Sakamoto following in his lead. Uh, they held their own in this match. I thought Yoshida did not embarrass himself, which is a plus. What What makes me so excited about the future of this company more so than the prospects of A10KZ holding the Dreamgate belts, more so than the class of 2020, is the fact that we've now seen for this entire year, no matter the circumstances, the Dragon Gate generation in multi-man matches has has figured it out. They they have the chemistry, they work like a well-oiled machine, and if they team this well, they are certainly going to be able to wrestle uh, against each other just as well. And I was just so blown away at the chemistry that Maria, Minora, Yuti, and Daya had, I it just this was nonstop action. It was 14 minutes of move after move after move. It all flowed together so well. I just loved uh, the build to the finish, and then Maria pinning Ashida, which uh, Mike, I've got to ask, and we'll break down the dangerous dangerous gate card in just a second. But I, I have to ask, does this finish? And you don't have to say uh, which direction you go, but does this finish sway you one way or another? as to the dangerous gate outcome it does make me think that there are two possibilities here when i thought that beforehand there was only one okay interesting i have the i had the exact opposite take uh so we'll we'll okay. just it opens up dangerous gate so we'll talk about it in just a few minutes yep and then the semi main was uh it was dragon gate versus toriumon benkei and kz teaming together with against the team of Naruki Doi and getting his paycheck, Yuzushi Kanda. And Yuzushi Kanda came out here and worked here on this match. Doi got the pin on, on Benkei from Modified uh, Crucifix. I thought that this was this was a match where I felt like we were kind of joking around last week. It's like, oh yeah, Kanda's out here. It's nice to see him get out of his house. He was not a passenger in this match. This was a tremendous tag match that he very much like showed it. Whenever Kanda has like been in Torimon, and outside of R.E.D., outside of the heel lineage, like over the last few years, he's actually been really good. And that's one of those things I remember like thinking this earlier this year, going like, oh, Kanda's in here. Oh, okay. And if you're someone's parachuting in, it's like, oh, Kanda. Kanda's actually really fun as a veteran in this role, and I felt like that this added to the match here. I'm going to pump the brakes just a little bit on the Kanda praise. I am fair and balanced, and I, I, I for as, as good as he was at this match— I would not necessarily call him fun, even if he's been involved in fun matches this year. But this was what we could file under away as sneaky good. Uh, this I I was watching the match, watching the match, and then by the finish I was like, oh my god, that was well, oh my god, I really enjoyed that. And, and the finish, I, look, you see Doi Konda, KZ, and Ben K in there. You think that Konda's going to be eating KZ time or you know running for him to the face, whatever it is. But Doi pinning Ben K. Just another wrinkle that just makes that Doi versus KZ match that much more interesting and a match that I ended up going three and a half stars with, which I was not anticipating going into it. I went three and three quarters. I, yeah, look, <laughs> like, I, I firmly uh, uh, justify that and, and support you with that decision because it really crept up on me as the match was going on, just how entertaining it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, you had, like, nice little interplay, like Ben K walking through a John Woo dropkick. Oh, my God. The the, the Konda Ben K interactions, for as good as Doi and KZ have been lately, it was Konda versus Ben K that actually sealed this match for me off of those John Woo spots, where it was just Ben K was doing stuff that we've seen this move for 20 years now, and Ben K was doing stuff to counter it that I had never really seen before. Yeah, yeah. And, like, that's a big thing is, like, Ben K now has a – he has an ability to kind of drift into a match where, like, you can tell that he's in the match, but he's only going to come in for his moments and just be a passenger. Neither that this really was a Doi and KZ preview match, but that ended up being more about Kanda and Ben K, which was really surprising and especially surprising how well it turned out. And then we had the main event case, and we're going to have to, there's some stuff to talk about this main event here. This was the traditional road to Dangerous Gate or road to the cage match, rather, a six-man special tag team match where they mix up all the sides. We had Ada, Yoshino, and Yamato on one side. Then we have BB, Hulk, Shimizu, and Kai on the other. Ada got the pin on Shimizu with a inside cradle after a low blow. Given all the discord, this made sense. If you were wondering, I don't think we asked about what the finish was going to be. This is what I guess the finish could have been last week. And should we get into the Yoshino stuff now or talk about the match first? 
I don't have much to say on the match. I said last week, for whatever reason, the Road to Cage match, six mans, never do anything for me. I think they're oddly heatless and just always, even if I understand their their point, they're just always a little clunky to me, and this match followed in that, in that trend. So by all means, uh, you have the floor again. Yeah, this was fine. I went three and a quarter. This was good, but just not he. It's just not necessarily like what you want is your big go home to match, and they love doing this match, and it's flustering. But the big story is so the finishing sequence was the usual closing stretch. Should note that Yoshino was looking pretty stiff coming into this match. Like he was not moving around as much. He started loosening up as the match was going around, but you could tell that he was not in one hundred percent condition. The finish of the match had, uh, I think it was Kai throw. Yoshino on the outside, and then there was referee distraction, low blow, and inside cradle. Yoshino did not get up. He stayed down throughout the finish. He stayed down throughout the mic work, and it was very clear that there was RED mic work of them all bickering, and then Yamato and uh, Kai trying to kind of, like, there was a moment where, like, Yamato and Kai are trying to be like, oh, we're still going to be friends going to this, and, like, Kai's like, no, my my career in this company is directed on this. And Yoshino was all was Ling still on his back on the outside? Uh, Toriyamon people all came around and kind of did like this. They kind of pulled an audible. audible Yo, Yamato did the uh, thank you very much for coming, good night thing, and then walked by him on the way back. A lot of people were really concerned. They came out later and said that Yoshino is okay. And worth noting where there's two house shows that happened this week of the time of recording. He was not booked for those shows to begin with, and he was not put back on those shows. So I... It's it's kind of difficult to say if I want to call this a pure work angle because of how he was looking earlier, unless he was just selling before the match even started, but it looked like that there was a scare on this night, and he's going to be off until his homecoming show on the 19th and then the cage match. Yeah, I take this as I do think he got either banged up in the match or was coming into this match really hurting, and on top of that, they were planning on doing some sort of angle with him after the match to either write him off of those house shows or he was never really booked in the first place, so to give him some time before his homecoming show. I don't think it's that big of a story. I think all the information that is out there is the information we're going to get. He'll be on his homecoming show on the 19th. He'll be on Dangerous Gate on the 21st. If I were a betting man and we'll talk about it, I would assume he's going to be wrestling after the 21st but given the stipulations, I can't entirely be sure, but I don't see that happening. So I I don't see any reason as of now to worry. Yeah, this isn't anything that really changed my guess on the cage match. Like I saw this and maybe it's like a little bit of a better percentage that he loses the match, but I'm still uh, on board with you with that. It's just something that was worth talking about as that kind of waking up on Sunday morning and then seeing a tweet from the Dragon Gate Japanese and Dragon Gate English count saying the Masato Yoshino is okay, guys. He's, he, we appreciate your concern, but he is okay, and he will be on the shows as as planned. So just felt like we needed to note that before we got into the previews for next week. Yeah, so let's talk about the man of the hour, Masato Yoshino. His homecoming show is Making Tape this year. It will air on the Dragon Gate Network on September 19th from Osaka in his hometown. Mike, do you want to quickly uh, run down this card? It should be a show just up top. Uh, I, I don't I don't know if we'll do audio on it because we will have the Dangerous Gate review next week and, yeah. and we want it, we'll want to get straight to that. I will, at the very least, be tweeting about it from the Open the Voice Gate account at Open Voice Gate. My thoughts on the show. Uh, Mike will probably do the same. There will not be a written review of it on VoicesOfWrestling.com, but that does not mean that you should not watch it because I actually like quite a bit of this card. Yeah, yeah. So this is in his home ward of Higashi Osaka. It's not in Osaka proper. I think it's just a suburb. But it is his 20th anniversary homecoming show. And interesting card. We have six matches. M- most interesting. Uh, like, there's a lot of interesting stuff on the card. But it starts off with a Toriumon versus Dragon Gate six man tag team match with Fuji, Saito, and Sachihoko Boy, as we talked about earlier, making tape for the first time since pre COVID versus Maria, Lee, and Tomonaga of uh, Dragon Gate. Singles match, Ginky Horiguchi versus Benke. Uh, interesting tag match, match three. We have the old Yokosuka Chome team of Sumi Yokosuka and Kagatora teaming up against Kota Minora and Dragon Daya. We have a six man Dragon Gate versus RED tag match with Keske Akuda, Kai, and UT versus Diamante, Cosmo Sakamoto, and Hio. 
Torimon versus Dragon Gate tag match with Shuji Kondo and Yuzushi Kanda versus Yamato and KZ. So we will get former tribe members in that match. And then we have Torimon versus RED eight man tag team match. It's the match you'd expect for this. It is his homecoming show. So it's Masato Yoshino, his professor, the principal of, of the Dragon System, Ultimo Dragon, his big partner, Naruki Doi, and Dragon Kid versus Ada, BB Hulk, Big R Shimizu, and Kaisuke, or sorry, and, K- and Kaito Ishida. It will be on the network on the, the 19th. It will it has a 6 p.m. Japanese Standard Time start, which is 5 a.m. on the East Coast, and then 9 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time. It's an interesting-looking show. Uh, ben K versus Horiguchi stands out to me just because the last time they had a singles match that made tape was... Uh, January 14th, 2018, and that was a two-minute singles match. Since then, they've wrestled twice in singles, both on non-televised shows. They had one Prime Zone match before that. By the way, that uh, that Osaka number two show, that uh, January 14th, 2018, Shima, Desmond Xavier, and Zachary Wentz versus Bandito, Flamita, and Rio Saito. Truly a different universe, but I, I like... I like that. The uh, Yokosuka and Kagatora versus Minora and Daya match. I hope they get some time. I hope they work hard. That could be a lot of fun. Uh, Kondo in there with Yamato, KZ, and surprisingly fun Kanda. Obviously, my eyes go to that just because of anything Kondo is doing right now. And the main event. For as much as I would have liked to have seen a Toriyaman team versus a Dragon Gate team, just for a match quality perspective, obviously the answer here is... If Toriyaman versus R.E.D., it plays into the cage match build. I'm sure we'll get more Yoshina versus Eita interplay in this match. And my hope is that it's, you know, quite a spectacle. It will be not only the 20th anniversary show of Yoshino's career, but his final homecoming show. So I really hope it it feels like a big deal and that while following COVID protocols, uh, it is still able to feel like a proper homecoming and also farewell for a uh, Dragon Gate legend. Yeah, I'm hoping that... I remember last year they had all the banners out. I know they don't really are allowing banners right now. And streamers has been something that Dragon Gate has really curtailed only for farewells and retirements. I'm hoping that we get streamers and banners here as much as one can do and do it safely. I feel like that this kind of show deserves it. Uh, one match that you didn't touch on that I'm really interested in, and of course this is real Mike Spears core, uh, UT going up against Diamante. That is interesting to me. <laughs> UT going up against Cosmo Sakamoto, incredibly interesting with me. Hio and Okuda in that match. That's that's a match that has a lot of different things going on in it. So it's going to be an interesting show on the 19th. But that's all really a precursor to the first, I guess, now of the big four shows this year in Oda City General Gym- Gymnasium. It is Dangerous Gate 2020 on September 21st. It will have live English commentary. I'm assuming it's going to be Jay and Ho Ho Loon on the call for that it will be starting at 3 p.m japanese standard time that's 2 p.m 2 a.m on the east coast 11 p.m on the west and 6 greenwich mean time in case it is a it's going to be an interesting show here it is for like these kind of shows here that they have there's a lot of people going to be left at home there's not going to be a dragon royal or anything but when you look at what's all on this show here there's not a lot of waste here. There's not a lot of fat that could cut from the show. There's a lot of things I find really, really interesting. Yeah, let's get right into it. Somehow we're an hour deep into the show and we haven't talked about our main topic. <laughs> it feels like real Voice of Wrestling flagship hours here. So let's go match by match. Let's let's break this down because there's a lot to be excited about. All right. So in all the build up to the mat to the show, Kaido Shida said he would defend the Open the Brave Fate title against Yosuke San Maria only if it was an opener because he views Yosuke San Maria as a comedy wrestler. In case you mentioned about the uh, go home interaction between them, about if it changed my opinion, I was firmly of the belief that Ishida was going to win this match. And I feel like they could have done a little bit of a swerve with that finish there, but I'm still heavily leaning towards uh, uh, Kaido Ishida leaving Tokyo as the Open the Brave Gate champion. So, this gimmick of it being in the opening match, it really made me freeze in my tracks and think about what was going to occur in this match. And Maria had been losing and losing and losing. And she lost to, she lost to yo. And I was going, God, I think, I think Maria's going to win that Ashita match. I think they're just going to build it up to where Maria loses in the build and then wins in the actual match. And, you know, catches Ashita with a flash pin or whatever. 
and that's going to be the end of Ishida's reign. And then I saw Maria pin Ishida on the second night, and I said, okay, there's no way Ishida's taking two different falls to Maria. He's winning this match. Maria has a rich history of Bravegate challenges and defenses. She typically rises to the occasion when she's in a match like this. Should it, It's also... It's just fun to see this match kick off the show rather than the eight-man tag that follows it. Because typically, you know, we typically see this in a match three or a match four. Here, it's opening up the show, which is just different. And it'll be a nice change of pace on these big shows. But at this point, I'm pushing all of my chips in on Ishida. I think he's retaining the Brave Gate belt here. Yeah, and if this was a show that did not have Doi versus KZ, I would say this is the sleeper match of the show. But that match is being positioned as, like, the big singles match on the show, so I can't say this. But, yeah, Maria is tremendous in her title challenges and her title defenses. Kaido Ishida is one of the best champions in wrestling right now. Given everything, he's probably put together as many solid defenses as anyone in wrestling right now. And I think that's a smart way to kick off the show. Like, yes, you're doing kind of the thing of saying Maria isn't good enough, but then you have the idea of this starts off the show on a hot pace which, especially given the next two matches, I think that's something that is a smart decision. Yeah, we go uh, to an eight-man cluster there. Mike, would you like to read off the participants in this smorgasbord <laughs> of a match? Real smorgasbord. <laughs> I mean, we we got mixed. Uh, this is an unaligned team versus a uh, a Dragon Gate Army team. We have Yuzushi Kanda, Kakatora, Gamma, and Hoho Loon versus Kaisuke Akuda. Problem Dragon Mondai Ryu is making an appearance. Punchstone Monaga and UT. And boy, that's a bunch of just... What do both teams talk to each other in the back before having this match? Yeah, God, uh, I would hate to be sandwiched between Kanda and Gamma on an elevator. I just... Uh, whatever they're talking about, I I know it's no good. I don't, I, I, I don't want to be involved. I, I mean... Ho Ho Loon is going to be sit- sitting there just like, just going like, all right, uh, we're going to have that. Uh, Kagator is probably fooling on his phone, <laughs> you know, just completely checked well, yeah, out. No, if we, like if we know Kagator at all, we know he's not paying attention and he's not invested <laughs> in whatever's happening. He's Thank not you engaged. For my point, Mike. Uh, no, this, I mean, this should be fine. I, I, I would love it. If, you know, Kagatora or Kanda pick up the pin on a Problem Dragon or a Tabanaga and Akuda working with the bottom rung of the Dragon Gate generation flips out. You know, he seems to have little patience for Ben K and Yamato and KZ. I can't imagine how stressed and uptight he's going to be teaming with Problem Dragon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's going to storm off somehow in this match, if not do more. Yeah, I, like, I think, like, happen. I remember when, when Naito went to Mexico and then came back, and, and we are talking about Tetsuya Naito on the show. I do apologize. I don't want to talk about him either. But, you know, when he came back from Mexico, he, he didn't fully form LIJ with his first few appearances. I actually think he worked at G1, still not really heel. I could be misremembering that, but I do remember a specific tag match where I, I think it was Naito and Hanma against Makabe and whoever else. But I just remember... You know, Naito coming out to the ring with Hanma, babyface team, here we go. And then as soon as the match starts, Naito just sort of pieces out, and that was the beginnings of his heel turn. I believe that was Dominion 2015, if my memory serves me correctly. Uh, That's off the top of my head. But I I could see Akuda doing a similar thing here, where he makes his entrance, and then reality sets in, and he realizes, oh shit, those are my partners. I will see you all in the back. (laughs) Yeah, and I, I could see, like, Okuda just, like, absolutely clobbering Kakatora with the lights out and just going, screw this, I'm gone. Like, I, I don't know necessarily what side I'm going on, but you can see a lot of finishes here. And ultimately, the only real interesting thing about this match is Okuda's involvement, I feel like. Yeah, no, it's the it's the only thing that will matter, even more so than Kakatora and UT being in there. They're not going to get time to do what they do best. And then we have another unaligned match, because that's what we... That's because we have Ultimo Dragon, Shuji Kondo, and Misaki Mochizuki against a whole bunch of just general, just uh, just jokers. I mean, you have Don Fuji, you have Ginky Horiguchi, and Ryo Saito. If I were to put money on this, this is your comedy match of the evening. It's a bummer because it could be a really, really good, heated, Tenru-esque style six-man with chair throwing and water bottle throwing and incomplete and utter destruction around ringside. 
But I do think you're right. I think the improv trio of Fuji, Horiguchi, and Saito, uh, they do seem like three dudes that could headline UCB Sunset if it was still in existence. And I do think <laughs> they will be uh, clowning around with Ultimo, Kondo, and Mochizuki. Yeah, they seem like a cage match. Seems better than the last one. <laughs> Absolutely. And then we have the singles match. The singles match is, uh, oh yeah, on, on that trios match, Ultima's going to win. Like, Ultima's going to win. Like, come on. Ultima's winning, right? Uh, I, yeah, I guess he's pinning Saito. Because there's no, between, yeah. if it was Ultimo Kondo and Fuji against Mochizuki and Marahara, Marahara Isapa, I can see Mochizuki getting the pin on somebody, but there's no one on the Fuji Horiguchi Saito side that uh, seems like they need that pinfall. Right, yeah. I mean, like that's my mindset. And then also, Mochizuki will be in the N one soon. Kondo hasn't taken a fall yet, and I don't think he will for a long time. And Ultimo. So yeah. Uh, then we get into the meat of the lineup here. This is the match we've kind of been ta- opining about for the last few weeks. It is the rematch of their Open the Dream Gate title match from February seventh, twenty twenty. This time, there's no titles on the line, but it's a special singles match as. You know, KZ was challenging Doi on Doi's turf before this uh, in February. Welcome to KZ's realm of the special singles t- match as Naruki Doi will be facing off against KZ. I, look, I said it earlier. The, the expectations for this match are through the roof, and, and I don't know how you could look at this and not think it is the immediate match of the night. I really think it's going to be that good if history has shown us anything, not only from their match in February— but from their King of Gate match last year in Cork and Hall, I I just it, you're right. This is the KZ special now. This is the KZ you know special singles match, and I I think it is going to absolutely deliver. The only question coming out of this is what do you do with KZ afterwards, Mike? Who do you think is winning this match? I think, and I'm gonna be using therapy words with this because I don't know anything for certain here. I'll say I believe <laughs> that with the finish that's going to happen in the steel cage that year, next a big show main event is going to be Ada versus KZ. I tend to agree. I do think, well, what what's the next big show? Is it World? Or, I'm sorry, Gate of Destiny? Uh, well, Gate of Origin. When is Origin? Gate of Origin. Uh, October. It's before Ooh, all of... Okay. It's before... It's a, it's so before how insane November is going to be. Okay, I thought it was in November. That does help my theory out. I am now Team Mike Spears. I do think that is what's going to happen. Uh, look, I, if KZ wins, I think he's the next Dream Gate challenger. If KZ loses, I think he's the one under the mask. And I don't think KZ is the one under the mask, so I think KZ is going to win this match. I thought Gate of Origin was after Des- Destiny and World. If Mike is correct in telling me it's in October, then I am firmly locked into that belief now that KZ is winning this match. Yeah, uh, no, I'm wrong. I apologize. Oh, Gate my. of Origin. I thought Gate of Origin, they've changed around where Gate of Origin is ever since they started. Oh, it was like the first week of September a few years ago. It's all over the place. Right. And then last year was October, so I thought, oh, it's going to be October. Okay, so we have a whole lot of homecoming shows in October. We have a we have a Fukuoka double shot. We have Tokyo Cork and Hall. We have KBS Hall. We have Sambo. And then we have everyone in the promotions homecoming that month. We've got Genki's homecoming. We've got Doi's homecoming and anniversary show. We have UT and Kabune homecoming. We have Madoka Kakuta homecoming. <laughs> everyone has homecoming show in October. But the lineup as we have for November right now, we'll probably have the full, a more full lineup later on, is uh, Ideon Reno Saka on the 3rd for Gid Destiny. Cork and Hall on the 5th of November. Kobe World uh, Pro Wrestling Festival 2020 on the 15th, and then Gate of Origin and Sendai Sun Plaza Hall on the 28th. I think it would be awesome if they did Ata versus KZ at the October Corkin. I don't see that happening. It would be, that'd be incredible yeah. if that happened. I still think we're ultimately going to get an Ata versus Yoshino Dreamgate match, and then the Yoshino Farewell very shortly after. Very similar to what they did with Tozawa. So... I don't know. I still think KZ wins this match. I could just, I, I, it's not as easy to plot out what happens afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Now seeing this and being wrong, I'll take my L there. It does make whoever Ada's next title offense is a lot more complicated. But I still think that the result's not in question. KZ should get the win here. Yeah, and if he doesn't, then I think he has to turn heel. Right, yeah. It's one way or the other. I mean, it's going to be, 
I mean, if if he does not turn heel and loses this match, then you really have to wonder how Dragon Gate actually views KZ. Like, <laughs> like that's what it comes down to with that. But then we get to the two, the second of the third title matches. We have an open the Triangle Gate Championship match. Champion team of Dragon Gate, Benke, Strong Machine J, and Dragon Daya versus Takashi Yoshida, Kazuma Sakamoto, Diamante. The Goon Squad are going up against the Dragon Gate army, and Dragon Daya has yet to figure out the Goon Squad. That's uh, That's got to be the story here, right? I mean, this Triangle Gate Challenger team... They can't. They can't win. We came into the year with Yoshida, Diamante, and Hio as the Triangle Gate champions. I don't want another version of that. I think Daya needs to, uh, God, I mean, hopefully pin Yoshida here. But Daya needs to pin somebody on R.E.D., right? Yeah. I mean, the only thing that makes me question it is if they want to have a bigger Triangle Gate team win it sometime in November. You know, I mean, is it going to go back to Team Torimon? I mean, Torimon had that very short title ring of, hey, remember Kanichiro Rai was a Triangle Gate champion this year? Case? I do. Ruled. I might be the only one. <laughs> I might be the only one, sadly. And you have Strong Machine J, who has been on the shelf. Uh, he has not been pulled from this match, so I'm assuming that he's able to go. But it does make you wonder things. He's someone who has had it. He's, he's picked up some dings and scrapes. He's been in the factory a lot since he is. He's like a Fiat. You know, I mean, he's the fiat of the roster. And, yeah, with D- with Daya, if if he does not get the finish here, when are you going to have Daya figuring out R.E.D.? Is it going to be him going up against Ishida and winning the Brave Gate? Because then that that's the only other way you pull this off, right? Yeah, it, it's, it's just, yeah, I, I'm really concerned that the Triangle Gate challengers are going to win this match. I don't think they will. I do think the story is Daya finally getting some sort of retribution on R.E.D., and maybe that leads to a future Brave Gate match. We'll see there. I would be really intrigued by that if they did one-third of the Triangle Gate champion versus the Brave Gate champion. Uh, maybe they do a double double title challenge there. I apologize for fantasy booking as much as I have, but there's so many opportunities coming out of this show. But I do hope and I do think that Daya is going to score the pin on one of the R.E.D. members. Yeah, it's just hard to talk me into a champion team of an outsider a Gaijin, and Yoshida right now. It's just, it, like, it's as much as I've really enjoyed Diamante, he's probably my my most improved wrestler of the year, to be honest. Not the kind of team that, like, and with Kazuma Sakamoto still being freelance and with Takashi Yoshida getting cycled off of just Osaka shows, don't have a lot of confidence in that team being a champion team. Yeah, no, it would be a bad reign, so I hope it doesn't happen. But I'll be interested in this match. You know, I think Daya and Diamante have been great together. Sakamoto, I know a lot of people still see Cosmo Sakamoto and think if they're parachuting into the show, Sakamoto's in this company. Cosmo Sakamoto works in Dragon Gate. This will be his 30 year anniversary, and he's been fun. Like, he's been fun in this promotion. And Strong Machine J, hopefully, he is able to go all out. And uh, as much as I talked about how much I've enjoyed uh, Yuzuki Kondo when he's not a passenger, uh, hopefully, Takashi Yoshida is a passenger on this thing. And, you know, maybe Ben K does some incredible things with uh, Yoshida and Diamante. Mike, that's, uh, we've spent far too much time on this Triangle Gate match. That is, uh, it's <laughs> just, uh, come on now, let's get to the Twin Gate match where I need to ask you, open the Twin Gate title, it's Kota Minora and Jason Lee defending against Susumu Yokosuka and Dragon Kid. Mike, who does Kota Minora pin to retain the titles in this match? I think he pins, uh, I think he pins Susumu Yokosuka. Yeah, I, th- I think I think he does the big dog pin on the big dog. He hits the gang, and, and you do the business because Susumu Yokosuka has that like Kyushu Pro match against the against that Kyushu team. That's probably going to win it, <laughs> win in in Fukuoka. At least that's the way I'm rationalizing it. Like, you know, he's going to be taking a loss to Mentai kid, kid and that other guy in in September. So like, why should he? Well, why shouldn't Minora get the pin on him beforehand? That's exactly what it is. It's going to be a gang in the middle of the ring, whether it's to Yokosuka or Kid. I can't I- entirely tell which one it's going to be. Look, I think Doi versus KZ is going to deliver no matter what. I think Ashita versus Maria could be really, really good. This is the match for me that I, I can't get a read on if we're talking, you know, fine little three-and-a-half-star match or if we're talking classic Twin Gate four-and-a-half-star match. 
Because it, it does have the feel, even with Dragon Kid being involved, it's not going to be your Shima and Ricochet versus Pac and Dragon Kid title match. It's going to be closer to a Mochi Fuji versus Shingo and Yamato type title match. And I think Minoru and Lee are capable of delivering in this spot. I think they are ready and willing to deliver in this spot. And you're looking at a team of Yokosuka and Dragon Kid, uh, not only two of the most historic wrestlers in the company, but specifically in the Twin Gate division. These are guys that tend to run the show a little bit. So I'm pumped for it. I think the champions retain. It's just a matter of which guy they pin in the finish. Yeah, yeah. And now that like we, we've like talked about like matches that we think they excel, like this is the match that's like, other than like the Trial Gate match, which, you know, I mean, that has variants baked in with the people involved here. According to how much time this match gets, you know, I mean, this could be that Mochi Fuji Shingo Yamato match you're talking about. I mean, this is like I can't impress how much I think this this Hal Rain is not for Kota Minor, but for Jason Lee. Like, this is a guy who's been around for a while who is just like I don't want to say wasting away because he was solid here, but he wasn't able to get to show his true his true ability, and this is a huge platform for him. I mean, he's semi main eventing a Big Five show, so. I'm, I really have high hopes on this match. This is like th- I really... this is the biggest match of Lee's career, yes. Oh, easily yeah. so. I mean, even as a Triangle Gate champion with uh, with Doyoshi, I mean, it, it was still like Triangle Gate matches that were like three ways. You know, yeah, it's po- it's like Triangle this... Gate post two thousand five. It's it's not the top. You know, it's not even the secondary title in the company. Yeah, and, and even when he was like teaming with Doi, tra- challenging for the Twin Gates, or even like his first uh, Bravegate shot against uh, Ishida, you know, I mean, that still was, like, lower on the, like, the, t- the match order on that show. Like, this is the biggest match of his career by far. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, because Lee has continued to deliver in every big spot, and I, I don't chalk the match that they won the belts uh, in. I don't chalk that as being a disappointment due to Lee and Minor. I think they were working with a just very peculiar, hard-to-work-with team there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and like this is, this is the match that you know, as you said, three and a half to four and a half stars is my expectation. You know, if any other than like KZ and Doi, which I put in its own category, if there's going to be any match that everyone's going to be talking about next week, it's going to be this Twin Gate match. It's either going to be that, or it's going to be the main event, the Steel Cage Six Way Match. Mike, there is a long list of rules to run down here. Would you be so kind and explain to the listeners one final time what is going down in this match? Especially since you bought me time to take a drink of water. <laughs> I appreciate it. All right. So this is the traditional Dragon Gate Steel Cage six-way risk match. As you all know by now, or for people who are parachuting in, here are your participants. Yamato, Kai, Masato Yoshino, Eita, BB Hulk, and Big R Shimizu. Now, each year they do a different quirk on the cage match. They certainly this year decided to go really quirky with this as it's as the Dragon Gate cage match will be decided by flagpole. There's no pinfall or submission in this match. It's only escaping the cage, and on the top they will have five flags with the Dragon Gate logo on there. You pull the flag, you've escaped the cage. That, that's the to my knowledge, that's the only way of determining a finish in this match case. I don't think I'm off when I'm saying that. No, my, that's my understanding as well. Alright. So here we go into the quirks here. So this is a entered order match. On August 12th, they had a match that decided the entry order. Number one and number two. Number one is, Binke, is Big Arshimizu. Number two is Kai. We'll start in the match. The number three, Masato Yoshino, will enter after five minutes. The number four, BB Hulk, will enter four minutes after that. So at nine that's when Hulk enters. Yoshino is at five. Number five, which is Yamato, will enter at ma- at three minutes after that. So at minute 12, that's when Yamato gets into this match. Number six, and the last person in this match, will enter after another three minutes. So 15 minutes is when Ada hits the ring. However, with this staggered entry this year, they are making sure not to have all five flags up top to begin with. So when... Big R, Shimizu, and Kai enter the match. There will only be one flag. And then when each person enters the match, there will be more flags added. Unlike past years where there's been a time limit or conditions to pulling a flag, as soon as you enter the cage, you can pull the flag. So 
kind of staggered entry, kind of like a Nanawa tag in a way, or War Games. I prefer to think of the Nanawa tag. It, it, it is the Open the Voice Game podcast. It is Nanawa tag rules. I'm sorry, Yoshida tag oh, rules. Of course. They changed the name. <laughs> it's so, so the big advantage here is if you're number one, you'll have five flags possibly to, to pull from. If you're Ada, you could be entering the match where it's just Yamato left in the cage and one flag's being put up and Yamato's waiting for him. So that's the elevated risk there. So that is, that's why it's so important and why Big R Shimizu is so proud of his number one entry form means that he gets the most opportunities to pull flags. Now let's get into the risks and stipulations case because this is another crinkle here. And, and, and while let's, let's predict the match as we go along with risk and stipulation. So let's go by entry order of, you know, Shimizu, Kai, et cetera, and give the possibility of whether or not these stakes or these consequences rather end up occurring. Right. So these risks all happened last month. They basically had matches basically deciding one side would get to choose the risk for these people. So they were decided on the 8th, 9th, and 10th in Kyoto, Osaka, and Nagoya. Starting with number one, Mr. Number One, Big R Shimizu, as decided by the Toriumon generation, because I think that's kind of important to denote who is listening to each one. His only risk is what happens if he loses the match. Some people will have different risks and different like, qualifications. His is one of the more simple ones. If he loses the cage match, does not pull a flag, and is left in the cage, he must leave R.E.D. He must cut his beautiful Ganos- Mr. Ganosuke hair into a crew cut, and he must return to his rookie gimmick of Ryotsu Shimizu. Case, what is the percentage chance of Shimizu losing this match? You know... I, I think it's like a 20% chance. I think it, it Shimizu is the red herring of this cage match because I think uh, they they have designed it in a way to make you think that he is the favorite to lose given the interaction between he and Ata. I I mean, the cage match, anything goes, anything's possible. I do think I know they're booking well enough to say it's probably not going to be him. Although, Shimizu coming in at number one in a staggered entry cage match and not escaping would fit his character very well, and his uh, risks are very realistic. So I can't totally ignore it, but I do think he's at about a 20% chance of losing this match. I'd probably go 10, just because of, you give him this gimmicks, he's already kind of seen as a buffoon, like he is seen kind of as the jokes are buffoon. He does this, he, 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 I don't know how you rehabilitate Big R Shimizu to any sort of like Dream Gate challenger. If he loses this match, uh, I I don't know. I think it go one way or another. I think it could really help him uh, if he comes back with a with a fresh coat of paint, or I think what your fear is that it just permanently damages him. And I don't have a read one way or another on what exactly would occur. I I look at it as if it does happen, I think it will help him in the long run. I I don't know how realistic Open the Dreamgate champion Big R Shimizu is. But if he respawns a little bit and creates something new, I, I, you know, again, as I've said many times, he has the talent to be the top guy. I think the gimmick is actually the bigger issue there. Okay, that's fair. I just see him losing. He turns into this generation's uh, post-2006 uh, Rio Saito. Which is like, a very real on. possibility. That's a, that's a good comp, Mike. Well done. I mean, I, 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 I'm a very comp-minded person, so I try to always bring like my biggest fire for comps for Open the Voice Gate. Let's talk about entry two. Kai, as decided by R.E.D. on August 8th, he has two different risks or possibilities here. And we kind of have to talk, kind of need to talk about both of them in concert with each other. If he loses the cage match, he must leave Dragon Gate forever. This isn't he has to leave the Dragon Gate generation. This is he leaves town. And if he's the first person to escape, he must join R.E.D., as R.E.D. chose this, basically I said, we want you in the mess long enough that if you get the the smooth idea of getting out of the cage first, you're with us now. So, Case, first off, what is the percentage chance of him pulling the first flag and joining R.E.D.? You know, I'm looking at this, and I, and I guess you said there's probably a 10% chance of Shimizu losing the match, which really makes me curious as to what you're thinking the result could be unless you're totally locked in on the result because I am not. I, I, I don't see it happening, but I also think there's a chance. 
that Kai loses this match. I'd put it at about a 30% chance because I just can't entirely escape that reality. Do I think he's going to join R.E.D. to answer the second part of that question? No. I, I think that's a 0% chance, but if it does happen, I, I think that would add a really unique wrinkle to the match. A, a mid-match turn, which you certainly don't see that often. I guess it's not even a turn because he's eliminating himself from the match. I don't see the, the first escape risk happening, but I would be open to it if it did. Yeah, I would say about 5% chance of him pulling that first flag. Yeah, 30, 30 be... seems high, but I just... Oh, I was first flag. I'm sorry. Go ahead. First flag. First flag. Yeah. Uh, 5% that, that happens for him. Probably 15% for him losing the match. Right? I just can't ignore it. Yeah, I can't ignore it. He's not contracted. He is a freelancer. And I can't discount that possibility. He's someone that has finally kind of found a niche here. And But there's enough people that a finish could happen where it's him and Yamato. And I could see him then turning... On Yamato joining R.E.D. independent of the result, pulling the flag and making Yamato be Hiroshi Yamato for the rest of 2020. You know, I can't discount that, but I think it's not one of the highest possibilities here. No, I think uh, who comes next? It's Yoshino. That's another one. Yeah. I'm just not not lucky on what happens to Yoshino if he loses this match. So, also as decided by R.E.D., if he loses this cage match, that's his only risk here. He must retire immediately. He will have his head shaved immediately after retiring. And then he will have a retirement match at Danger Skate with Mr. Oda Ward, Naruki Doi. So that's it for him. No Kobe World. No no Gate of Destiny in his hometown, the big arena in his hometown. And no chance of him in Doid Arts. That's the one I'm, I'm thinking about, of course. <laughs> Naturally. Look, I... I hope this doesn't happen, one, just because I'm working on something and my timeline would be incredibly rushed uh, if Yoshino decides decides to retire on this show. I would say it it would be a much more realistic possibility if the head-shaving stipulation was not there. With all three of those things listed, it's a 10% chance. I think it's very, very unlikely this occurs. 25%. Really? I think that him having his homecoming show and having the warm and fuzzy moment there is something to keep in mind. I don't think he's leaving the company. I think we both can say without without getting in trouble with anyone. This, regardless of when Yoshino leaves, Yoshino will be around Dragon Gate. Oh, he's yeah, not no, going to just not, disappear. That's not gossip. He, I mean, he works for the office. That's yeah, that's totally he, legitimate. He, he's a member of the board. Yeah. He, he he's he's a member of the board and. If I, I would think that I would not be surprised if maybe he becomes the journal manager. You know, Yagi, you know, he, he could focus on refereeing. Now it's journal manager Yoshino. You know, I, th- I, I could see that being his role going forward. It's just like, he looked really bad at Osaka. Like, the first real moment, other of like him taking matches off, where I'm like, he is looking rough. And we were told when this would happen. When he would retire, it would be sometime this year. This could be the exit. This could have been the exit shoot. And I have it at 25%, but I don't think that's my, that that is by far not my most likely scenario here. No, no. Just saying. No, no. Neither is it mine. So please, uh, who who enters after Yoshino is BB Hulk. Yep, BB Hulk is decided by Dragon Gate Generation. His terms are only if he loses the match. If he loses the match, he must revert to his real name. Terumasa Ishihara and starts career over at zero. He must join Mizo- Mochizuki Dojo as a trainee. Uh, worth noting here, BB Hulk debuted as BB Hulk. He's only been referred to as his last name or his actual name, just like an offhandedly. Like it's one of those things that I don't think it was actually public in like the uh, Shoe Pro directory for a long time, but now it is. And he started with a gimmick. And he started not necessarily as a rookie. So this would actually be like a bigger step back than you would think about with this. And I'm 0%. I don't think this happens at all. Yeah, I love the stipulation, but I am also at 0%. It's safe to say that BB Hulk will be pulling a flag. Very much so. All right. Then we go to number five, Yamato. If Yamato loses the cage match, as set by the Torimon generation, so... Those were all really heavy ones that we went through. Yamato's is kind of the wink-wink-nudge-nudge one as I kind of sussed out. For the Rex, 
of 2020, he has to do the opening ring talk segment with Mr. Kikuchi instead of uh, Takeyuki Yagi. And this is because Toriyama's generation thinks that Yamato does not know how to talk on the microphone. He just rambles. <laughs> Number two, he must change his rear gear, his ring gear, to designless briefs. He must also change his entrance gown to a bathrobe, and he must straighten his hair. I think both of these are making a joke at Hiroshi Yamato's extent because they both use a, a, a ring name of Yamato. And if you straighten out his hair and you take away everything else, he looks like Hiroshi Yamato, who was with the company as a freelancer for 2018, 2019. Yeah. Rightfully taking shots at Hiroshi Yamato. I enjoy the company now that he's not there. And I think there is a 0% chance of this happening. You know, just so I'm not over 50% for someone, I'm saying 10. Cause I, it's only two months. Okay. It's it's only three months. It's only three months. He's someone that like, his hair has always been kind of a thing and now it's long again and it could, they could really play it up there. And it's something that, you know, this could be something to like push into a heel turn down the road. You know, there's something that he gets frustrated and like flips out at the last quarter end of the year. Yeah, very so much so. I, and that gets us to the open, the dream gate champion Ada. If you remember from the last show where they had the number change match, Shimizu won the, the number change and changed Ada, who was previously at number three, to be the last person to get into the match. So here is his stipulations. And now I see how smart one of them was. First off, if he escapes the cage whatsoever, first, no penalty. He walks away the same way he came in. Then we get to tricky things. Dragon Gate Generation had some fun with this. First off, if he does not escape the cage first, his next title defense, which would be his first title defense, will be against a member of the Dragon Gate generation. And if he loses the cage match, not only do I, I guess he still has to make the defense against the Dragon Gate generation, but he must also join the Dragon Gate generation. In case I think this is the finish, I think Ada loses this match. I do too. I think there's a about a 40% chance he loses, and I think there's about a 90% chance that he's not the first one to escape, meaning that he'll have to defend the Dream Gate belt against a member of the Dragon Gate generation. It's a bold move for someone that won the, the Dream Gate belt in August and has not defended it uh, at all to lose this match, but I think in him losing it sets up uh, just a, a just an array of possibilities, and I think him losing is the most interesting result as well. So I counted up my math. I've been keeping notes of this. I had 10% for Shimizu, 15% for Kai, 20% for Yo- 25% for Yoshino, 10% for Yamato, and that meant I had 40% for Ada, which I meant to make it that I think that Ada is going to like win this match uh, or lose this match. But here's what I think is going to happen here. Because there's one thing that the cage matches are known for, Case, and that's for turns and drama. Here's my finish I'm going to lay out to you, because I believe Ada is losing this match as well. I think that the final three people in this cage are Ada, Masato Yoshino, and either or either Big R Shimizu or BB Hulk. I think that Ada gets a moment, much like a Yamato in the cage match that he was turned on that launched his face turn, where he can grab the flag or escape or leave Yoshino in the ring really hurt against a Shimizu or Hulk. And I think he turns face, gets back into the ring, and then R.E.D. just piles on to him. Yoshino's able to get the uh, flag, and then it's going to be R.E.D. versus Ada, and then they get the flag and cement the fact that Ada is out of R.E.D. and has to join the Dragon Gate generation. I certainly I certainly like the idea of Ada, Shimizu, and Yoshino being the last three in the ring, and I think their their stakes are the highest other than Kai, but Kai's not on their level. Uh, so so I look at that as it's going to come down to H.S. Shimizu and Yoshino, likely, and I, I maintain uh, I like your idea, too, and I, I think H will end up losing, and that will be the Dangerous Gate cage match for this year. Yeah, and it's an interesting one. It's one of the ones that, you know, with everything, now that I'm, like, looking at, as soon as they announced the order and the stakes, I had the idea that Ada no doubt, was turning face here. And now I'm, like, even more certain with how the order is going to be that it's going to be a turn in here. And I think he does have his own volition. I think that it's a decision he makes, and I think it's something that it's time for the A to face turn. 
It's, it's time. been a long time since we've seen him as a face. Yeah, I mean, 2016 or 2017. 2017, yeah. All right. So that is the uh, lineup for Dangerous Gate 2020. As Case said, we will be back next week doing a review of it. Case will have a written review, of course, later this week. Probably after the time we get this out, we will have a written preview on Voices of Wrestling for this. And, yeah, we are now looking into the hot stretch. This is going to be, as as I kind of confuse myself on with this, there's a lot of big shows remaining this year, and it really kicks off this weekend. And, Case, unless you have any other notes or thoughts, uh, I, I'm ready to get out of here. Real quick note, because I know we are, are going long, but if you are new to the promotion and have not seen the cage matches before, or if you would like to uh, re-watch some cage matches on the Dragon Gate Network currently, uh, Dead or Alive 2019, that cage match is on there. Dead or Alive 2018, 2017, 2016, 2015, and 2014. All of those cage matches are available on Dragon Gate Network right now. I would recommend especially the cage match from 2016 if you have not seen it. I do think that is one of the yes. better incarnations of this match. There's also the original cage match, 2001 Absolute Mente, five-way escape mask versus hair match with Shima, Darkness Dragon, Dragon Kid, Masaki Mochizuki, and Magnum Tokyo that was just uploaded to the Toriyaman section of the Dragon Gate Network, so that is there as well. The only three missing are the Dead or Alive 2008, Final Gate 2009, and Gate of Destiny 2011 cage matches. Uh, if you listen to this the week it comes out, two weeks from now, we will be discussing the Gate of Destiny 2011 cage match on the Dragon Gate USA Rewind and Rewatch series that will be on the Revolt show, uh, the Revolt 2011 review. That is my personal favorite cage match. I think it is a work of art and arguably a five-star match. In years past, I have not thrown a star rating on the cage match. I have now determined that is cowardice. And so for the Voices of Wrestling review this year, I will be star rating it. I expect it to be on the spreadsheet. The cage match is one of the most unique things in wrestling. We talk all the time about how no company can match their six mans or their tag matches or this and that. Literally, no other company can do the cage matches. So if you haven't seen them or you'd like to rewatch some, again, Dead or Alive 2014 through 2019, those cage matches are on the network. And the 2001 Absolute Amente cage match is in the Toriumon section on the Dragon Gate Network. And that is all I have, Mike. Yeah, 2016 is my favorite as well. Uh, we didn't really like give people a precursor what these kind of cage matches are. Expect some shenanigans, guys. This is not like a huge like uh, war game style, just like guys just being dudes, just clocking each other. You know, the, the, this is this is when in the past we have Misaki Mochizuki act as a robot. We had Masato Yoshino take batting practice. We've had. Gamma, like, just get really perverted. This is a wacky match, just as a last thing for people who have never seen the matches before. Expect some hijinks, because hijinks will ensue. And, it, and it, you know, it's, it's, it, you're right. It's not the War Games match, but it's just as heated as every good War Games match you've ever seen. So I look forward to it every year. I expect this one to deliver, just like they always do. Yep, and that will do it for this episode of Open the Voice Gate. We'll be back with you next week, reviewing this show, probably touching a little bit on the uh, the homecoming, not a whole lot. This will probably be mainly about Dangerous Gate and talking about the big ramifications is this will be a match that in one way or another will change drastically the output or the outlook of Dragon Gate. You can follow me on Twitter at Fujiheya. You can follow Case at underscore in your case. You can follow the podcast at Open Voice Gate. Thank you all for listening. We'll be back with you on next Thursday for our Dangerous Gate uh, review show. So take care, everyone.